Raphael, we're here at the FQXI conference, Physics of the Observer, what happens, we're in this amazing uh, setting. Um, after almost a century of quantum mechanics, so why are we still talking about physics of the observer? What, what, is, what, what, what have we missed? It has a funny history, the story of the observer in quantum mechanics. Um, in the early decades, uh, I think there was a lot of uh, mysticism that was surrounding the subject, that an observer is somehow central um, to the notion of making a measurement, um, and that, that the wave function collapses when perhaps you know, a human being enters the room and, and checks on the cat, um, and only then, and so it seemed like it was of the most profound importance to, 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 to laws of physics, what observers are, uh, since they possess this amazing capability to make the wave function collapse and decide between death and life for the cat. Um, that was wrong, but um, even after we understood a more pedestrian and therefore far more plausible ways of describing what happens to the cat, which do not appeal to conscious observers, uh, there are still uh, questions in, in the context of quantum mechanics, particularly when we try to apply it to cosmology, where we seem to run into the question of, of having to divide, at the very least, the universe between something that's being looked at and something that's doing the looking. And, and how we describe sequences of events happening in the universe, which sequences of events might happen, um, can in principle depend on how that division is chosen. I find that something that I can live with. Uh, I don't see that as posing uh, any real contradictions, but it is something that's worth keeping in mind. Why is that happening? Why is, to study the universe, do you have to divide it into the observed and the observer? And for the, for the universe, what could possibly be an observer? Well, in quantum mechanics, um, when you study the time evolution uh, of any system, um, it, the evolution is actually completely determined, and in some sense, nothing ever happens in that uh, w what the state of the system at one time is completely determined by the state of the system at any other time. In some sense, they're completely equivalent to each other. When we say that an atom decayed, mm -hmm. and therefore the cat died or was, was uh, kept alive, we cannot describe this uh, by following this completely deterministic evolution of the quantum mechanical wave function. This sort of thing only happens uh, if we take into account that there are parts of the world that the system interacts with that we don't keep track of. So there are always light particles bouncing off the cat, for example, which are whether we, we are there or not measuring whether the cat is alive or mm. has its leg up in the air. And, and it's the fact that we're not following the state of these light particles that causes the evolution to go from being deterministic to being probabilistic. If we kept track of absolutely everything in the universe, nothing would really happen. And so it's the fact that we are not keeping track of part of the universe, which is allowing things to happen. If by happen you mean that there is some sequence where there's a step that you could not have predicted with certainty and you have to really wait for it to happen and then you know the outcome. But if you followed every particle in the universe as it as it interacted with what you were me measuring you you what would be your condition if, if you could do that th right so if, if if we somehow tried to describe the universe as a whole and we never made any division between things that we keep track of and things we don't keep track of uh, usually people call that the system and the environment uh, if you don't make that division then nothing ever happens Right, then then uh, quantum mechanics would just tell you that there's a completely deterministic evolution. Knowing the state of the universe at one time is as good as knowing it any other time, and, and, so, and so nothing would happen in that sense. Uh, but thing, things are happening, and they're just happening in, the, in, in, a, in, a, in a deterministic way? Yeah, you could say it that way. You could say it, so things are happening in a deterministic way. Um, but that description of the universe, in which things are happening only in a deterministic yeah. way, involves situations which we never experience. And so it, it would not be a very satisfying description of the universe. So we never experience um, a superposition of a chair being here and a chair, sure. the same chair also being there, right. uh, or of a dead being both dead and alive at the same time. 
And so to the extent that we're interested in describing um, the world as we experience it, we have to take into account the fact that we're not following all parts of the world. Right. Uh, and, and this turns out to be an essential thing to take into account in order to go from this bizarre description where cats are dead and alive to the one that we actually see. Right. Well, I mean, I, c I can understand just by analogy. I mean, we have a, a wedding behind me that is uh, involved, and you, you sort of, you, you're not keeping track of that. So, I mean, I, I can understand that uh, in, in, uh, in that we're unable to keep track of everything and integrate it into our into into our thinking. Uh, but it, it's just not clear how, if you do keep track of it, and it's still a quantum system, which is probabilistic that it becomes deterministic. Right, well, um, remember that the goal of physics is to um, explain as efficiently as possible the things that we observe. Right. Um, now, n nobody has ever tried to keep track of all the uh, air particles and all the light particles and everything that interacts with a, with a system that we study, and in practice it would be completely impossible. Um, but because nobody has, it is certainly consistent to have a theory that says that if we did, oh, huh. uh, nothing would happen, uh -huh. uh, as long as that theory also explains what we do see when we don't keep track uh -huh. of things, uh -huh. which is uh, the normal state of affairs. But I think I understand where you're coming from. It is, in, in some ways, um, irritating and, and, and disconcerting uh -huh. that um, what actually happens in nature might depend on how we draw that division line and that if we randomly you know draw a different line dividing things that are being kept track of from mm -hmm. those that don't then you might come up with a completely different history and uh, in fact this is something that bothered uh, Lenny Susskind and, and me a few years ago um, and we tried to find um, situations where you might be able to point at a more objective way of, of, def of, of defining the system and the environment, of dividing the universe in what, what can be seen and what cannot be seen. And drawing on lessons coming from, from the study of black holes, um, we suggested that, uh, well, we should take into account a property that our real universe actually has. It has something called an event horizon which surrounds us. And particles that travel far enough away from us, mm. this is billions of light years, so they have to travel quite a distance, but eventually they will, they're really gone for good. Uh, at least to the approximation that we can describe the universe as, as you know, a, a geometric object with things living, living in it. So at least at, at that level of approximation, these things are completely gone, and everybody is going to agree that they're gone, and we're not just being lazy, not <coughs> keeping track mm -hmm. of them. And using those particles, those light particles, galaxies, whatever flies out of our um, event horizon, um, you can get a very nice, almost objective uh, description of the sequence mm -hmm. of events that shaped our universe without having to appeal to, um, well, here are the humans and they're not looking at this and that molecule. Mm -hmm. So I think that is, I think, a partial step in, in the direction of making um, making what happens in the world more objective. But I, I really want to stress that it's not something that we get to impose on the world. That things that we feel should be objective has to have to be fundamentally, completely unambiguous and objective. Uh, it's something that uh, either is consistent with the laws of physics um, that we find or is not.